जय श्री मन्नारायण जय श्री मन्नारायण जय श्री मन्नारायण आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू माय स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर श्री मद जगत गुरु सुदर्शन आचार्य जी महाराज आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू लॉर्ड श्री रामानुज आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू आवर पूर्व आचार्य आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू आवर ट्वेल्व अलवार्स आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू मदर लक्ष्मी एंड आई पे मोर ऑब्जेक्शंस टू लॉर्ड श्री मन्नारायण I welcome all of you here physically at the Sri Narayan Dham in Durban, South Africa. I welcome those that's watching this discourse locally, nationally, and internationally, and I welcome in advance those that's going to be watching this discourse when it is posted on YouTube and the various groups from around the world subsequently. I have been. to three funerals in the past month and all three were from the african culture and this is the first time in my 62 years that i have attended a funeral from the african culture and i was I was quite pleased to see and experience the African rites and the manner in which this funeral took place. I also noticed that it was mostly westernized and I discussed this with my African brothers that the colonists really colonized the minds of the blacks when they entered this country and I'm sure those that attended these funerals would me would have noticed that it was more western western dress western culture western type of decor western food and i'm saying this with love it is another rip off by the white man these funerals cost a hell of a lot i think in the region of 200000 where the the entire coffin a beautiful casket is buried with the body so unlike the indian funeral where the coffin is rolled into the crematorium just the inner casket is taken and and set alight in this funeral the entire coffin is lowered into the grave and buried so so this gave me a need to discuss the soul and the fruitlessness of having these funerals that cost an exorbitant amount of money generally a funeral was supposed to be attended by attendees without even a huge amount of concentration on the external trappings of the funeral rather uh, the consoling the mourning family this this should be the principle on which funeral should be attended but i also noticed in our Hindu funerals now. Uh, when you walk in these halls, I don't even think that the deceased ever had 
in most of the cases such a beautiful welcome when they were alive than when they did. Uh, decor, uh, flowers, I think these are things we should be exchanging with, with our parents, with our people while they are alive. So Krini, on your way home, buy that beautiful bouquet, give him some nice flowers, let him enjoy that bouquet while he's still alive. Instead of putting a decor at his funeral with hundreds of bouquets on either side, it's not going to help Strini, not going to help Dad in any way. It's just a waste. It is a waste. But the same amount of bouquets, the same decor, go home one day, wash his entire kitchen for him, wash his curtains, do something whilst he's alive and let him appreciate it. Leave the funeral simple and ordinary. It is a time of mourning and I can't see how you can synthesize decor, a whole lot of decoration and mourning in the same sentence. You know, it, it, it just doesn't fit. Uh, the, the soul has left that particular body. It's hovering around the body, it's watching what you are doing. And it is senseless to make a soul happy after it has departed from the body. Make the soul happy while it's in the body. Go out of your way and make sure that you, you know those souls associated with you. Because me, mom and dad, keep them happy. Because me, while they alive. Don't take your entire inheritance and and do a funeral for your mom and dad. It won't help them in any way. All right? Keep them happy whilst they alive. So, I want to discuss the soul in depth. I want you to understand our attraction to things that are actually nothing. You understand? And we are all fixated with money. But is there really something that you can validate in your lifetime without going into depth and validate money? Is money a real entity? Is money a reality? Is money real? Okay, I'm asking in a deep sense because if you trace your money, you carry a receipt. Your money is a receipt for that value of gold that is somewhere which you, you will never see, you will never touch, you will never have an association with in your lifetime, guarantee. You will but look at how much of attraction we have over this thing that is perceivably there. How many people died for money? Like what percentage of people, how much of relationships are broken because of this thing that is not really there? You just carry a part of a tree. You carry in a part of a tree, a dead part of a tree. You carry in a dead part of a tree. And now in this world of technology, there will come a time where you won't even have to carry that dead part of a tree. You touch a few buttons on your laptop or your phone and that perceived money moves from here to there. But did it really move? Did it really move? Yeah. Again, I'm talking in a deeper sense. I want you to understand that 
we are so fixated on something that's an illusion. Is money an illusion? And look at our fixation on, on this thing called money, where we go to work for something that we're going to use to feed our, we, everyone say, you have to work to feed yourself. Then we have to get this illusion to feed our stomach. But yet there are millions of people that don't work and they still feed their Again, I'm, 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 I'm talking in a deeper sense. I'm talking relative to the soul. I'm talking money relative to the soul and not to the body. Because money is required for the the existence of the body because society has made it. So is money not a societal concept? Money, is it not a societal concept? Initially, uh, we would be living in a rural environment. When creation starts, we're living in a rural environment. And she asked me if she wants to eat chicken, she tell her mom, give your goat to the neighbor and get a hen from the neighbor, five hens, so she can have chicken for a long time. That is, you two fall in the category. <laughs> All right, one goat, five, you, you understand? There was no money, it was a commodity exchange. Now, commodity has been replaced by money, but you use that money to get commodity directly without bartering. That was the bartering system. I'm just bringing in the evolution and how money came into play. And there are certain people in the world that controlling this monetary system. And if you control the monetary system, you control the world. If you control the monetary system, you control this world. And this is why I have got involved directly in the politics of this country. You would have noticed that I left my throne, my Vyasasana and I went around wherever I was called to call out this monetary system because whoever controls this system controls the entire world and today our country is South Africa our country is South Africa forget India forget India where God placed you where you took your birth you must be loyal to that country all right our external body as Indian origin. Our soul has universal origin, which can be anywhere at any given time. All of you understand? So it is this reason that I am trying to break that white monopoly capital that is running South Africa. And I know one day it's going to happen. And I'm intertwining that with the soul. So going back to the funeral, I think it was very serene. Uh, uh, all the three funerals were related to uh, former President uh, Zuma. One was his adopted son, one was his brother, and one was one was? Yeah, Didi uh, Nyani, the former CEO of South African Airways. And I want to pay my respects to all of these three, three personalities. Uh, uh, Jacob Zuma's brother, I, I met him once at Nkandla and he broke protocol for, for myself, Jessica and Vasan. 
uh, to go and see President Zuma. He went out of his way. He didn't want us to come back to Dublin after sitting there for eight hours. And he ensured that we had our time with President Zuma. He broke protocol from Nkandla, uh, Joseph Zuma. And I never met his son. But all these funerals that I attended were peaceful. Uh, uh, we felt the soul's presence. And this is w one of my functions, oneness. And you can only experience oneness if you attend and get involved in another culture directly and not theoretically. Uh, I can read about the African culture, I can read about the Khoisan culture, but unless I immerse myself and my consciousness directly into it, I cannot come back and teach you anything. Because you can also read what I can read. But you need to learn from my conscious experience. So we, in Sanatana Dharma, if you want knowledge, then you cannot speculate on the knowledge. That knowledge that you desire must be absolutely <coughs> spiritually scientific. Spiritually scientific. There is no room for speculation in Sanatan Dharma because God has ensured that whatever inquiry a man makes, there is sufficient answers and evidence and practicality to prove the answer. And originally the answer is given by the Supreme Lord himself. So if we are discussing the soul, who must the Guru ask? And where must the Guru retrieve these answers? No way. As Nani and Nana, Aji and Aja, who the Guru must get these answers directly from the Supreme Lord himself. So there is two ways in which this information has been passed down to mankind. One, through the meditation of saints and sages at the beginning of every creation. And two, when the Supreme Lord himself incarnates and he reveals this information directly. So do we know when the Supreme Lord incarnated? Yes. He incarnated twice already. Once in Treta Yug, two million years ago as Lord Ram, and once at the end of Dwapara Yug, five thousand years ago as Lord Krishna. Do we know which scripture gives us this evidence? The Ramayan is evidential, scriptural evidence of the Lord's existence, Lord Ram, two million years ago, and Lord Krishna, five thousand years ago, is depicted in the Mahabharata. And a segment of the Mahabharata the Lord speaks on many occasions in the Mahabharata, but the one that has one segment that has been taken out and popularized is the Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita, in a few verses, the Supreme Lord answers the question on the soul. So I am giving you a description of the soul from the Creator Himself. From the Creator Himself. This is 
the duty of a guru duty of a guru is to give you word for word or verbatim from the supreme lord knowledge but the guru can subsequently break down the knowledge for easy understanding so bhagavad gita of lord shri ramanuj which is called the shri ramanuja gita bhasya and i want to start from chapter 2 verse 13 and it's a description of the soul and i will try to bring it more to a more practical understanding but this is what he is telling arjuna just as the soul associated with a body passes through childhood youth and old age pertaining to that body so too at death it passes into another world a wise man is not deluded by death so let's understand what he said yaj van se dawn ya so there's yaj van Yes, sir. <laughs> Who? Yes, my sister is there. Ashmika, you can show. You can turn around. So, though there's Cyril as a child. There's Cyril as a youthful young man. And there's Cyril as Cyril himself. grandson father uh, son and himself but let's look at all three as him okay because once upon a time when cyril was 4 years um very sure if you find this photograph he was looking like that so <laughs> and then like in his youth he was looking like avir and now in his old age he is looking as he is looking okay you can focus back to me am important <laughs> camera was on a husband was stuck on a husband all right so let's you look at one entity now and let's be logical okay when cyril was 4 years old when cyril was 30 years old and when cyril is now in his hundreds <laughs> is the body the same but there is something in cyril that's telling him it was me at 4 it was me at 30 and it's me now at 101 it's me what is that something that's telling cyril it is me because that body that was there at four has dissolved into the cosmos as dissolved into the cosmos in its entirety in it entirety that eyes that sulu was watching everything at four sulu what were you looking at four that eyes that you had at four has been fully replaced that bones in your body you assume it's the same bones all the bones in your body has been fully replaced your heart has been fully replaced all right some people have granite hearts i'm not saying you sir <laughs> but 
<laughs> Even the granite be replaced by granite until you come to a guru. Guru dissolves a granite heart into a humble heart. Alright, that's the job of a guru. So even your heart, your lungs, your gallbladder, your teeth, everything in your body when you are a child, your entire body has been replaced. Then you went into a youth, that body has been replaced. I'm sure you want that body back. <laughs> But unfortunately, it has been replaced in its entirety. So the body is changing constantly. The body is changing constantly, but you cannot see it. You cannot see it. How can we prove this? How can we prove that your body is changing constantly, but we cannot see it? If you light a candle, if you light a candle, the flame at the point of combustion keeps changing. The flickering is so fast, it looks like one continuous flame on the candle, but that flame replaces another flame at the point of combustion, and it is changing all the time. But when you look in at that flame, you think that flame is the same. A easier understanding will be when you open a tap you will see a body all the time. If you open the tap at a certain pressure, you will see a water body all the time. Yes? But is that water body changing? That molecule of water that fell and touched the drain is already gone. But when you look at a tap draining itself of water, it looks as if that water is the same all the time, yes or no? But where's the molecule that entered the mouth of the water, uh, of the tap first? It reached the drain first and it's gone, yes? So similarly, the atoms in your body is changing all the time. And this is why I'm talking to my ladies with love. One, two, three, Four. Only talking to four. One, two, three, four. Today, buying cosmetics is a waste of. <laughs> waste of time. Because the skin is changing on its own all the time. You can't see it, but it's changing. You trying to replace the skin. But it's changing naturally all the time. And I'm saying this word, no. love, rather give the guru the money. <laughs> and the guru can give you this knowledge. And use this knowledge. And you'll, that change you want to effect on your skin is there already, provided by the creator himself. You think you need this knowledge? Is this knowledge going to make some difference in your life? Yes. So like that water body that's emanating from the tap, your body is similarly undergoing change every millisecond. And if something that changes every millisecond, is it a valuable thing? Is it valuable? Something that changes every second. Does it hold a whole amount of value? Can you hold it? Can you own it? Understand what I'm saying again? I'm 
I'm saying it a little deeply, but if you don't understand, I'm going to repeat myself. If something changes all the time, has it any value? Why it does not have value? Because it keeps changing. Can you own that change? And can you own that entity? But look, how much of our life span, again I'm saying it with love, my colleague is, how much time in your life you spend in front of the mirror? For something that is, this is just an example, right? Don't get upset and leave the satsang. This is just one of the millions of examples that we're spending so much of time on something that is changing and fluxing and waning continuously. Where should we, where should we spending our time on? Understand what I'm saying. You own the body when you was born. That body is your birth body is gone. You are at the moment in a body that you was not born in. True? Your body kept leaving you. And right now as you're listening to this discourse, your body is still leaving. There is a perception there is a perception by yourself that this body that you have is a body that you were born. Is it a perception? Because whatever you were born in, that vehicle is gone. Scrapyard, it's now in another vehicle. These atoms, they keep changing. As we said, everything in this universe is energy. This energy inside this body the atoms in this, in the Guru's body, is given the Guru's body shape. Atoms in Guru's body, given the Guru's body shape. The atoms in a rock is given the rock shape. Yes? And the atoms in this external structure of this ashram is given this ashram shape. But all these atoms can be interchanged. All these atoms can be interchanged. One day the atom is the skin, the next day it can be the blood, the next day it can be the bone, the next day it can be the rock. These atoms can be interchanged. But there is one entity that cannot be changed, that cannot be touched, that is changeless, that is witnessing the change without being aware that it is a witness. Hello? Yes, because you know your body when you are the baby. Well, up until four years, you can recall your body then, and you can recall your body when you are 35, and you witnessing and experiencing your body now, today, at this point in time. And whilst you seated here today, in this discourse, thousands of atoms left your body already. Mm. Yeah, 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 at this discourse, and thousands entered your body. So, who witnessed your childhood, who witnessed your youth and who witnessed your current status quo? So you have witnessed the death, millions of deaths of your own self because photographs in each year will show you several from here and several there. Are you understanding? 
but yet because you do not know who you are you believe that you are everybody that you have millions of body at each point in time you believe i am this body and right now you are believing you are that body sitting with the glasses at 101 All right but yet if at baby's age you started getting this information as he is getting it and if he continues to get this information when he gets into 13 years 14 years 15 years how much of time you think he'll spend on the wants and the needs and the desire of something that he is not and how much time you think he'll spend on replenishing his own soul himself if he had the information if his software can be changed from i am the body to i am the soul his life will be monumentally different from yours yes because he will see that the only valuable entity in which he need to attach himself will be his and once you attach yourself to the soul and realize that you are the soul then where's room for happiness and sadness is there such thing as happiness and sadness does it exist if you live as the soul then there's no place for happiness and no place for sadness why it's fleeting it's fleeting it has no real existence in it happiness and sadness has no real existence has no real existence you give it existence from external factors you because your body is connected to all external objects through the senses and because you believe you are the body then you believe you are the senses are you the eye you know the eye but when you see something gross what you feel see an accident with the horse and trailer crashed over 20 cars the i saw it what do you feel it's connected to a emotion i'm just giving you a gross uh, scenario but you are not that i you are not the i the i is only an object which can be pulled out and you can trample it it is it will go back into the five elements of earth. what are the five elements of earth air air <laughs> sound sorry air space water earth and fire so if you take your eyes you smash it down there it will evaporate in ultimately into this elements yes so can it be you can it be you do you understand but this is what gave rise to that information and this is why some western scholars 
do not understand the Bhagavad Gita when the Supreme Lord explains to Arjuna that death is inevitable. If you don't kill them, they are already dead. You understand? So let us come back back to this. Just as the self associated with the body passes through childhood, youth and old age, so too at death it passes into another body. A wise man is not deluded by that. I want you to understand. So when you were four, you passed to another body. Let's let's look at it in sequence. When you were four years, did you have a funeral? Anybody did you cry for your body? <laughs> no? Was there any grieving? Yes. But did you exchange your body? Yes. Then when you was youth, any funeral? Mm. Now Cyril is there. <laughs> still no funeral. He still got a body. But this body that is named Cyril now will become a baby in the womb. Cyril, not you, you'll get liberated if you stick around with the Guru. <laughs> but I'm saying, hypothetically, that same body which was four, then was 35, now at a certain age will leave his body and will start into another body will start that life in a, another body. So his childhood body died, his youth body died, his old body died, and he's taken birth as a young child again. What is the purpose of grieving? Because that rotation will carry on until Cyril realized that if I don't follow this Guru, I don't know how I landed here, but if I follow this Guru through initiation, then when his soul leaves this body, Lord Narayan will send the Vishnu Dutas. Lord Narayan will send the Vishnu Dutas and carry the soul out of this material atmosphere. Will carry his soul out of this material atmosphere and he will live as a spiritual body. He will live as a spiritual body which can never change. Which can never ever change. So let's do another verse. I can go on with this verse, but I just want you to get the gist of what I am saying. Otherwise, it will be too much for you to absorb and you continue with your makeup. <laughs> See, I know these four ladies today when they go home, they're going to look at their makeup very, very suspiciously. Okay, okay. very suspiciously. Fourteen. The contact of senses with their objects, O Arjuna, give rise to feelings of cold and heat, trauma, pleasure and pain. They come and go, never <coughs> lasting long. Endure them. Endure. So let's look. So we have this body. And now you're going to feel cold. <laughs> Now you're going to feel cold because the instrument that gives rise to feelings in our body are our senses. How many senses we have? Let's name them. Sense of smell, sense of sight, sense of hearing, <coughs> sense of tasting and 
sense of touch. You see, we have senses in our heart. Now, they view senses in every part of the car. In the olden days, it was mechanical. Now they're coming closer to God's creation, which is man. You, when we throw water on the windscreen, what happens to the wipers? Alright? But did you see what made the wiper work? Did you see what activated the wiper? But it worked. And we have other senses. These modern cars, they see other cars and they press the brakes for you. Yes? Then these cars can park themselves. Yes? So if these mechanical things can give you such a high performance, then imagine God's creation, you and how high your performance level is. So this I, sense of sight, sense of sight is not this I. This I is an instrument behind which is the sensor for the eye. Are you understanding? This is the gross eye. This is the gross eye, which the sense behind this eye allow you to see. The sense of sight. Are you understanding? And similarly, if you cut your ears, you can still hear. Why? Because this is the, the ear. The senses are in the back. And what is the object of the senses? So in this room, all of you are looking at the Guru right now, and the Guru is looking at all of you all. So the object of my sight is this entire room, yes? And the object of your sight is the Guru and this entire Ashram. These are the object of the senses which you can see through the Now this, when you leave here at, after lunch, <coughs> will this place still be the same as you are sitting here? Right? What you do, what you do, the first thing is you remove all the chair covers, all go for washing. Mataji puts it in there. Before you reach home, it's in the machine, getting washed for. Next week. Yes? So the sight that gave you pleasure. Now, how many of you are pleasurable seeing the Guru? And this will be 99 of you will like. <laughs> In Ashram, guaranteed. You understand? How many of you are getting pleasure seeing the Guru? Hmm? How many of you are getting pleasure seeing the Guru? You understand? So it's a pleasurable sight. The object of your senses is pleasurable. Now, if you're feeling cold, come in a plant. But in two hours, all this will be changed. Guru will be in his kuti. The entire setting in this room will be changed. <coughs> So that pleasure that you are getting now, right now at this point in time, if you watch all the chairs gone and no guru here, and if you are finding pleasure, then you'll find you won't be happy when you see that this room is empty. Yes? Because the conditions in this room change. So your pleasure and pain depends on the condition of your senses. Yes? Your condition of your senses, is it a permanent reality? Yes. 
So the object of your senses change and the condition of your senses related to the object will make a change in your emotions. So is emotion a permanent entity? Now, what your object of senses like and dislike is unique to you. So when a vegetarian, when Jessica sees vegetables, she is happy. Her emotions are happy. But when she looks not too far, <laughs> Satish is eating meat, same eyes, in the same kitchen, same eyes in the same kitchen, just one degree turn, she saw Satish's dead rotten chicken, <laughs> and she becomes miserable. And she becomes miserable because the condition the condition of her senses changed her emotions. And when Satish looks at Jessica's vegetable, first he looked at his chicken, he was happy, <laughs> then he looked at the vegetable, and he was absolutely disgusted. How the hell do I eat this? You understand? So you can see vegetable to one person senses was pleasurable, the same vegetable to another person's sense was miserable. Are you understanding where the Guru is going? So we should not attach ourselves to the condition of the senses because the condition of the senses will be different and unique to different bodies and different perspectives we should align ourselves to the witness of the senses. Who's the witness that witness the senses being pleasurable and displeasurable? Who was that witness? Unchanging witness. Who witnessed pleasure and who witnessed displeasure? If you align yourself to the entity that was unchanged in this, Will you feel pleasure and pain? Will the conditions of pleasure and pain affect you? Are you understanding? And that is the soul. That is the real you. You are continuously witnessing the change in this universe. That which appeals to you you are happy, and that which does not appeal to you, you are unhappy, and this you is the, when you assume you are the body. As soon as you throw away this assumption that you are the body, and you understand that I am timeless, I am changeless, I am eternal. There's nothing in this world that can harm me. There is absolutely nothing in this world that can harm me. I'm just using this vehicle at this point in time of my existence. I existed before this vehicle and I'll exist after this vehicle. My existence status is always pure and is always blissful. I am covered by this vehicle that I am driving in now and that is why I cannot experience my blissful state for I have misinterpreted my existence. I have always believed together with everyone else 
that I am this vehicle. Now I need to disengage myself from the vehicle in terms of emotions, but continue to live in it and let it transport me to my eternal, blissful, pure self. Easy for me to say this, difficult for you to understand. But if you take something of this discourse, and this is not from me, it's from God, your Creator. Your Creator is giving you the reason why you are miserable. Who's giving you the reason? Your Creator is giving you the reason why you are miserable. I have been designated by your Creator to give you this information. Your Creator is not a Hindu. Your Creator is not a Hindu. Your Creator is not a Muslim. Your Creator is not a Christian. Your Creator is not a Jew. Your Creator is simply your Creator. This information is for all of mankind. It's my culture to dress like this whilst I disseminate this information. It's my culture to dress and to give this information with this background. This information can be used in the church, it can be used in the mosque, it can be used in the synagogue, it can be used in any part of the world, it can also be used by an atheist. Can an atheist use this information? Can an atheist use this information? If an atheist can discard the notion that he is the body and understand he is the soul, at that point he becomes atheist. But he can use this information and exist with this information in a blissful life. Can an atheist live a blissful life knowing he is the soul? He can. Yes. So this information is for blacks, it's for whites, it's for colors, it's for humanity. And this is why you got this human body. This is why you got this human body only for this information. For God to tell you that you are the soul. This human body you got not for marriage, not for children. These are secondary. Not for anything else. This human vehicle is for you to understand that you are the soul. Because God cannot get a cow guru to tell the cows that the cow is a soul or the rabbit. How many guru systems we have in 8.4 million species? If every system has to have a guru, imagine a snake telling another snake. Right? <laughs> so, you understand? <clears throat> so we have this body. The minute the soul leaves the body, what happens? What stops first? Where does the soul take its residence? In the heart. What is the function of the heart? What is the function of the heart? The soul is the energy that kick starts the function of the heart. What is the function of the heart again? Nimitta is not here. How? It is a pump, it is an energy. It kick starts the process where oxygen starts moving through the lungs, through the brain. So when the heart stops, what happens? We say you are brain dead. Uh, before, I think right up to now, medical science is looking when your brain is dead, then you are dead. But actually, it's when the heart stops functioning, the oxygenation process stops, and that's when the brain stops. So where does the soul sit? 
in the heart. When it leaves that heart, when it leaves that heart, the body sees to exist. Are you understanding? You know this. How do you know this? It's because of the substantive consciousness of the soul that you are self aware. That that makes you that is why Cyril knows that he was the witness from the day he was in his mother's womb, nappy changes day, well, uh, throughout all those days, uh, Cyril, I don't think they had kindies in your time, <laughs> the old bed sheets and, you know, uh, toweling napkins and uh, all of that until you came. That substantive consciousness is giving you a small window to tell you that it was me, Cyril, from that state to that state, which is the part of your substantive consciousness. And it is your attributive consciousness that looks outwards. That looks outwards and sees the guru, sees this ashram, sees your son, sees your daughter-in-law, sees your grandson. It's your attributive consciousness, part of the soul that sees all of these things. So I'm going to name this this course, the soul part one. I will make sure you put it on YouTube and send me a WhatsApp that it's in YouTube. Okay, because we'll do a series and maybe a few years later, I don't know whether it'll be here, it won't be here, but when I want this information, I'll just want to download it and we can put it in a book form. So this will be the soul part one. Are there any questions? Okay, so I'm also going to use the soul, reincarnation, and all of this to scientifically prove the Bhagavad Gita and uh, bring in President Zuma in the mix. I'm going to tell you who he was in his previous lifetime, uh, how he was born, and uh, I'll show you through the Bhagavad Gita who President Zuma really is as a so, and why I am su supporting him in his entirety, you know. When I first started supporting him, people thought Guru was gone, of supporting a corrupt and a thief and all of that. And I think now the world has realized that Zuma is one of the most honest uh, presidents on this earth. He did not take bribery from the capital system that I explained, you know, those people that were controlling money, they couldn't buy him. And as we go further, you'll notice that his true character, but I'll intertwine it with, with, with the soul and who he was previously, who he is now. And uh, I've given the secret to some people. I hope they don't sell me out on that. I think Jessica is the only person that knows in this room. And uh, let's see up until that my discourse whether she sold this information. <laughs> that is it. itching to go home now. On the way, before I'm the driveway, Jessica. <laughs> I don't need to get a guru so <laughs> Okay. No, you want this I information. I want to tell you that she eats the beer separately and I eat the chicken separately. <laughs> okay. You carry on loving the chicken, my boy. Huh? Karma is growing. <laughs> eat chicken, you ate. <laughs> Each that was killed for Satish Bhai. Remember, if you eat meat, anyone that eats meat shares the karma of that death. It starts with the avatar, then the transporter who was driving the meat to make a living, then the butcher who sold that meat, and then that wife who cooked the meat. Doesn't matter if she's a vegetarian. <laughs> so, so that karma system. Uh, is absolute. <laughs> you can't go to Lord Narayan and say, Lord, Why am I, I cook the meat, but I eat vegetables. You're part of that crime. And that person works in the court, she, uh, courts, she knows the law, she knows what accessory after, 
the complex successfully after the fact here. Alright? Jay Shiva.